Okay, hello everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in here. This is Dr. Javier Palacios and I am going to be talking about naturopathic approaches to migraine headaches. It is a video that I've been meaning to do a very long time ago and I finally got a chance to do it. And we're gonna talk about so many things related to migraines, which is one of the things that I really like to learn and educate people about. So with much further ado, let's get into this. Come on slides, no, oh, you're going too far. Okay, so what we're going to be learning today is the basics of migraines. So things like, what is a migraine? What are some things, interesting things we should know about them? Pathophysiology, how does it happen? Diagnosis, how your doctor is going to see it. Red flags, things to be careful about, because as you may know, migraines is a very severe type of headache that he has, it's not a normal type of headache. Uh, allopathic management, which is what your conventional doctor might do. And then naturopathic management. So doctors like myself, who, what can they do for you when you're to manage your migraines? And then I wanna do a small meditation visualization, visualization to help our my, your migraines stabilize perhaps and some final words. Now, a disclaimer to keep in mind, we're gonna read it together so you know what to be careful of. So this, in, this following information is only for educational purposes. This is not a substitute for professional medical advice or treatment for specific medical diseases. So you have to consult your primary healthcare provider regarding your own medical condition, in this case, migraines, before applying any of the mentions, recommendations presented here. We are not responsible for any action or inaction taken by the viewer. So before we get into this, just let me give you a quick introduction about myself. I am a, uh, not, I have a doctorate in naturopathic medicine from the University, University of Bridgeport. I'm licensed in the state of Connecticut. I'm bilingual in English and Spanish. I also have a certification in cranial sacral therapy, which is where I learn about neck pain and headaches, which include migraines. And as a naturopath, we're specialized in safe and effective natural therapies. Okay, so here I have a story to share with you to provide some insight into somebody or those who have migraines or what we call migraineurs, which is somebody who suffers from migraines. If you are somebody who has experienced migraines for a long time, then you know this story will relate to you in some ways. If you know somebody who has migraines, it might also be a similar situation. If you're somebody who does not understand what migraines are, but are still willing to have an open mind and learn, this will provide quite an insight because it is a true story from Scarlett in this case. So I'll get started. She's a 30 year, 38 year old woman, Scarlett. She suffered migraines for as long as she can remember. She has been going to her specialist, in this case, a neurologist, because those are the people who tend to uh, see migraines, patients, for the past five years. Her migraines tend to come randomly, but she, but she does notice they get worse after eating some kinds of foods, especially like cheese, aged cheese, red wine, chocolates, and coffee. After knowing those triggers, she took them out of her diet, those kinds of foods, and notice the severity decreased. Uh, she is married and has one son in college in this present moment, but at the time of the story, uh, his son, her son, Michael, uh, was graduating high school. So one day, Scarlett was preparing to go to her son's graduation, high school graduation, on a warm, sunny day in June, and it was perfect for the ceremony. But everything went well until Scarlett began to notice in her vision little flashes of lights, which we'll learn that's called aura. And that's usually a trigger that the migraine is coming soon. It's a, it's a warning sign. So for her, it was. 
So she took the medication from her doctor that the doctor said, you know, take it before the migraine begins. And she did. And she had an hour to prepare and get ready to go. And she thought maybe it'll, it'll go away by then. But within an hour, her migraines became intolerable. They became worse. She got to the point where she had to close herself in a room with everything dark, all the lights off and the windows covered. And she had to call her husband and her parents to let them know that she just can't go to the ceremony. So obviously not, not a ideal event. And during graduation, when her son Michael was walking down the aisle, you know, he got his name, he received his diploma, and he saw his family, but his mom wasn't there. So he was smiling on the outside, but inside, not so much. Uh, he got upset about that, and he refused to go to dinner afterwards. And, you know, he was upset. He wanted to like, tell off his mom in a way. But the moment they all got home from graduation, they noticed that his mom was laying on the sofa, but she was unconscious. And then next to her were three different bottles of pills. Her husband right away called 911. They had to take her to the intensive care unit, the ICU. And the emergency doctor just said that he probably, she probably had an overdose. So, uh, they treated her um, for liver damage because it seemed like she had a lot of Tylenol in it. And I think the medication they used was NAC or N-acetylcysteine, which like helps to detoxify the liver from the immediate damage. Uh, but it was, thankfully, she didn't have major complications after that. But it made Michael realize how severe her migraines were. She overdosed because she wanted to be there for him but she couldn't, it was just too severe. The migraines could not stop it. And he never felt more sympathetic to that before until now. And that's why in his words, his mom is the strongest hero he's ever known. So the story had a happy ending, but in some cases when people take too much medication, thinking that their migraines is going to go away, it can end up hurting other things, other organs more, and the migraines just won't get any better. So be careful with that. And I hope this provides some insight into what migraine sufferers do and how they react to what's going on in their lives, because it's not something they can control in this case. Okay, so some definitions to keep in mind, because I'm going to define what a migraine is. So it is a form of periodic headaches from one side or both sides of the head. The pain is moderate to severe with a pulsing sensation. Like it feels like something is blowing up inside of you, like slowly blowing up. And you can have nausea, vomiting, increased sensitivity to light, and sound, dizziness, and blur vision, aura, cognitive disturbances, among other symptoms. And these headaches, they tend to last from four to 72 hours. That's three days. And some of them may last even longer, but that's the average of a migraine attack. Now terms, photophobia, phonophobia. So photophobia, as you can see the word right there, phobia, that means fear. Photo is light, meaning that you cannot tolerate light. Phonophobia, it's unable to tolerate sound, like loud sounds. Uh, unilateral, which we will see in the diagnosis, is one-sided. Bilateral, bi meaning two, two-sided. Emesis is a word that they like to use a lot, which means vomiting in the medical community. And then aura are like those flashes of lights that you'll see that in this case of Scarlett, that's what she was triggered. Now, keep in mind this aura is from a 
medical contemporary usage is not the new usage of the new age world that they use aura, which is a color of a person's energy field that is emitted according to the state of health or emotions. So for example, if you're angry, you may show a red aura. That's that's the kind of aura that is, that's, that's not what we're, we're not talking about this. In this case, aura is just flashes of lights in your vision that are not normal. Now, some migraine facts to keep in mind. It is the sixth most disabling condition in the world. About 38 million Americans get migraines. About 1 billion in the world get migraines. And then three out of four of these sufferers are women. And about 50% of migraineurs go undiagnosed and untreated. And unfortunately, migraines is not something you can treat yourself. You can cause a lot more damage by trying to treat it yourself than get the right diagnosis and the right treatment for this. So please, I hope this helps you pursue that type of education in case you know somebody who may have it or you yourself like need a second opinion. Now we're gonna talk a little bit more about some possible causes of migraines. It is not a solid cause, but it may contribute. Some theories have been speculated out there and I wanna mention just a few, or at least two. One of them is the hypothalamus. And if you see it in the picture, the first picture in the center, right in the square, you have the hypothalamus, which is close to the pituitary gland. These are known as the brain of the brain. Like they regulate all your internal balances. And this is a whole list of things and we're gonna read it right here. So regulates blood pressure, BP is blood pressure, HR is heart rate, hormones production, your temperature, your body temperature is regulated here, circadian rhythm, your appetite and thirst, and your sexual behavior and response. Now, there seems to be something going wrong, some type of malfunction going wrong here that can lead to migraine attacks. It is believed that a migraine attack can be from an irregular lifestyle. It is not always the case, but those who have irregular lifestyle like working third shifts or having sleep schedules very, cra very crazy or even fasting for long periods of time, it's going to lead to some type of disharmony in the, in the hypothalamus and your whole body that can, could lead to a migraine attack. So it is a possibility, but again, it's not an, a solid cause of migraines. Another part that is more on the cellular level going in to the body is the mitochondria. So your cell, think of your cell like a blob of, a little blob of, a little circle blob of liquid. And inside this little blob is, you need energy to make this blob live and reproduce and do everything it needs to do. It has this little thing called mitochondria, and these are called the powerhouse of the cell. These are responsible for adenosine triphosphate or energy, ATP is what I abbreviated here, for the cells and the body. These are underdeveloped. It is believed that it's underdeveloped in cases of people who have had migraines. It is a genetic component because, or at least it has been linked genetically because women who have children, you know, meet women with migraines who have children, it has been shown that they tend to pass down their migraines with them as well. Not always, but in many cases, especially if the, if the offspring or the, the, ch the child will be a daughter. So underdeveloped means that it doesn't have the ability to grab them as ox that much oxygen back. So without much oxygen, you can't, the mitochondria cannot make that much energy. And if you cannot make that much energy, the cell is not going to perform the work that it needs to perform. And it's going to cause a cascade events, a, a series of events that's going to make the ability to decrease in 
effectiveness. And this is a huge contribution to the auras, to the flashes of light that migraineurs tend to sense. Now, aura can be flashes of lights, but some, some people can have other type of phenomena like listening to other things or voices. And it has nothing to do with their psychiatric history. It's just a, phenom a phenomenon that happens in their brain. So I hope this makes a little bit more sense as to what could be leading to migraines. Now, a diagnosis, something to keep in mind. Again, your family doctor might do this with you, but if not, he'll definitely have to send you to a neurologist who are the people who are going to do the checklist for you so they can diagnose you properly with your migraine. So there's two types of migraines that you can see. 1.1, migraine without aura, without the flashes of light, and then migraines with aura. So the migraine without aura, you have to just uh, follow what I'm saying here. So there's at least five attacks that fulfill the following. So at least five attacks. Headaches that last from four to 72 hours, which again, we saw that's how long it lasts. The headache is like two of this below. So you either have one-sided location, pulsating quality, like it's blowing up, moderate to severe pain intensity, meaning that you just can't stand it, it's too much. And it's worse by or unable, or it prevents you from doing physical activity and your daily chores. And one thing, last thing, during the headache, at least one of the following, you have nausea or vomiting, and or you may also have photophobia, phonophobia, meaning unable to tolerate lights or sounds. Now, migraines with aura, you have two attacks with the following, at least one of the following reversible symptoms. And again, reversible, meaning that it goes back to normal. If it's not reversible, that's more serious. So visual changes, so changes in your sight, sensory changes, so in your touch, changes in your speech or language, like sometimes you may not be able to make words, even though you think you are. A motor movement, which means voluntary muscle movement, sometimes you may shake. Um, brainstem, symptoms, which in this case can be vertigo, ringing in your ears, double vision, or even low level of consciousness, which could lead you to pass out. And then retinal aura symptoms, which could be spasms in your blood vessels that are one-sided. So you may have to, may actually feel your eye like pulsating a little. And again, I'm saying it one more time, to not that self-diagnose by using what I just said here. You have to see a doctor, somebody who can directly qualify, directly uh, hone down the symptoms on you and provide the correct assessment. Red flags. Now, these are things that you have to keep in mind because these are symptoms that could be worse than a migraine. And the, and the, the problem, is that a lot of migraine symptoms can sometimes imitate a stroke. If you have, if you know somebody who has had a stroke or you know well what a stroke is, you realize there's a lot of similarities in that. So this is a criteria that will help us understand that it actually is worse than a migraine and it could be to something worse, like a stroke or maybe something else. So red flags, things to watch out for. Thunderclap headaches, which means these are Headaches that hurt, first of all, hurt, hurt like, you know, a lot. And it comes about 60 seconds. It just comes 60 seconds and then they go out and then come back, but they're severe. They're really hard. They're really bad. Also, you start getting migraines after 50 or before 10 years old. Those are times to see a doctor. You have persistent morning headaches with nausea. A new number four, new onset headache with history of cancer or HIV. Be careful with that. Number five, progressive headaches 
worsening over the week. So it's getting worse. Usually with migraineurs, they have a level, they know their level of pain. But if it gets worse, that's something to be watch out, watch out for. Number six, headaches with postural changes. Meaning that as you change, as you lay down or as you stand up, if you get headaches from that, be careful. Number seven, aura symptoms last more than one hour. You know, the little flashes of lights. Uh, you can have loss of motor usage, like your muscles don't work well. Uh, different from the previous aura. So the auras, again, usually they're the same every time you get a migraine, but if they change, be careful. And then they occur first time in over-the-counter medicines. So if you take lots of medicines that are over-the-counter, like Advil, Tylenol, things to help the headaches, and they happen, they give you auras from that, you know, be careful. Now let's move on to the allopathic management. What can we, what will your conventional doctor, your primary physician, your neurologist, what might they do to help the pain? So first thing is they can use first line, which is like the first usage. They will use, they will recommend you like analgesics, acetaminophen, acetaminophen ibuprofen, those are like Tylenol and Advil. Antiemetics, domperidone, antiemetics, remember the word emesis means to throw up. So anti-emetic meaning against vomiting. So these medications will prevent you from having vomiting symptoms if you are one of those migraine sufferers. And caffeine with NSAIDs, NSAIDs are another form of painkillers and, so, and they combine it with caffeine. Now, for some people it works, not everyone. So keep that in mind. It's not going to be a solution for everyone. So for some, caffeine makes their migraines worse. In the case of Scarlett, it made them worse. So she was not taking caffeine as medication. Uh, the second line are this group of medication of drugs called triptans. So you will see some names like sumatriptan, somitriptan, risatriptan, and you see in the underline it has triptan in it. And these are good to help abort the headache, which means to like decrease the severity or maybe stop the migraine attack. If they don't work after three uses, the doctor should provide you a new option or another triptan. And then one thing to keep in mind is that triptans should not be used with people who have a history of heart disease. One thing to just keep in mind. or something you should tell your doctor that you have heart disease and maybe, and then your doctor should provide you other alternatives like here. Other forms of medicines that you can get is preventative. So these types of medicines that you'll see first line like beta blockers, tricyclic antidepressants, anticonvulsants, which are anticonvulsants are like epilepsy medicines. You will think like why am I taking antidepressants? Why am I taking anti-epileptic medicines? Why am I taking beta blockers, which beta blockers are to slow down the heart rate? Like why would I be taking that? Well, one of the things that can help your migraines get better, at least in the sense of the pain, is to shut down the nerve signal. So as you can see in the picture, there's two nerves. These are two neurons, nerve cells, and how they communicate with each other is to send signals from like one end to another. And you see where it says on the box, synapse, that's how they communicate. They're like little tentacles that touch each other and communicate. <clears throat> now, this is obviously necessary for our function so we can move and feel things. But when it comes to pain, this is overwhelmed. So there's too much synapse, too much pain going on. So these medicines are help are gonna help to decrease the threshold so you don't feel that much pain anymore. Um, other types of medicines that you can get is also serotonin antagonist, which is similar to a CRPG antibody, which we'll talk about that briefly. And then this word, onabutolinum toxin A. In other words, a form of Botox. If you 
you probably know Botox is used to you know, prevent wrinkles, but it also helps prevent pain because what they do, they inject the toxin from the bacteria, botulinum, into the ending, the nerve endings. And that's going to kill those nerves. So if you kill those nerves, then you don't feel any pain. So it does help some people, but keep in mind, nerves grow back. You can't just get rid of it. It grows back, so you'll have them again in a couple months, I believe. Um, the CGRP antibody treatment, those, those are kind of like new. On the past few years, they've been getting quite a, they've been getting more attention because they are on the side a little bit more safe and very effective as well. CGRP stands for calcitonin gene, I believe it's calcitonin gene related peptide. Here we go. So erenumab is a type of IV injection, so intravenous, and then uvrogepant or uvralvi. That one is an oral medication. This one just came out like less than two years ago for sure. And this is what we're gonna talk about. Now, the CGRP antagonist. So this type of medicine, the calcitonin gene-related peptide, how it works, normally this chemical works in the trigeminal nerve. The trigeminal nerve is a nerve that comes from the sides of your, of your face and provides sensation to the, your whole face and inside of your mouth, you know, and even your nose, so everything. In a migraine sufferer, this nerves get triggered and that's what leads to the pain. And that's where you just, the pain that you can't tolerate. And that's done through vasodilation and just pain tr triggers. So this CGRP basically leads to pain, like it allows you to pain because it's, a, it's an inflammatory response to the, the noxious, the noxious stimulus, which means something is bothering the area. So this is gonna lead to pain. Now, the antibodies, the antagonist, antagonist means against, against that right here antagonist, they stop this CG, these chemicals from working. So if they stop these chemicals working, then the vasodilation won't happen. The blood vessels will stay calm and the triggers, the inflammatory trigger will not happen. So you will not have much pain. And that's how it's supposed to work. And again, for in theory, you know, it's supposed to work well in practice and evidence. I will say about 70% of people have some type of effectiveness from this, which I think it's a high percentage. So that's how it works. If you like to read it, please feel free to pause it. Um, but yeah, that's how it essentially works. So that's what we're talking about from the allopathic conventional method. Now from my naturopathic management, my naturopathic perspective and expertise, these are some things that I wanna mention. And again, dosages are not going to be discussed here because you need an individual assessment. The dosages are going to differ from person to person. So do not self-medicate, even if these are natural alternatives. If you take too much of something, it can be toxic. If you take too little, it's not going to work. So you have to discuss your dosage with your naturopathic doctor or a qualified professional who knows about this and knows your condition and medical history. Okay, with that, let's get into this. So natural alternatives, as you see in the picture, we're gonna make the mitochondria more efficient. Remember, the mitochondria is that little organelle in the cell that makes the energy, the ATP. It needs it to work. So the more ATP you can make, the more efficient it's going to be. So some help that we can help so, or some help that we can provide are these types of uh, natural supplements. So riboflavin is also known as vitamin B2. 
He has great evidence for migraines. And the only, night, the only thing that you get as a side effect is yellow urine, very bright. But that's it, that's all. Uh, magnesium is part of your, it's part of about 300 different metabolic processes. So the mitochondria is one of those 300, has one of few, so magnesium is definitely something to try and have because it also relaxes muscles as well. Carnitine is a type of non-essential amino acid that can help you get, it helps move fats from the outside of the cell into the mitochondria. So the mitochondria can break it down, chop it up and use it and eat it and make energy from that. So carnitine, and it's another good help. MCT oil is a type of fat from um, coconut oil. And it's MCT means medium chain triglycerides, which are like smaller forms of fat, but they're also nice because they can go into the mitochondria and they can be broken down very easily. Alpha lipoic acid, this is also helpful in the mitochondria in an enzyme called pyruvate dehydrogenase, I believe. And what it does, it helps to move the sugar, the carbohydrates, the fructose, all those sugars that you eat. And then ALA, it helps to shuttle that into the mitochondrial ATP, where ATP gets made. Uh, CoQ10, this is directly proportional to the ATP formation. So this is re directly related to making ATP. Usually high doses are recommended for migraineurs. Next component of naturopathic management that I wanna go over is herbal therapy. So herbs, these are very helpful for prevention. Now, which means that you have to take this for a while before you start noticing some differences. One of these that have been shown to help are feverfew. You can see the Latin name and the Scientific Cooperative for Phytotherapy. What's where the evidence is shown in Europe. They have used lots of therapies and lots of evidence on migraines for this particular herbs or herbs for this particular condition. Uh, Butterbur is a type of another herb and usually it has some toxin component in it, but many, many supplements today, they take those components out so you can safely take butterbur long-term without risking any side effects or any serious side effects. Uh, curcumin is uh, an active component of turmeric. If you remember turmeric from long time ago, but it's very good for you because it's anti-inflammatory. And then coriandrum, sativum or simply coriander. It's another form of anti-inflammatory anti that you can just use as a spice in your salads or, you know, chopped, little chopped vegetables that you usually get dried up. And then for an acute attack, it's been not always health, not always effective, but for some it does help is to use menthol, which is really comes from essential oil from the mint family. And what they do is they just do on, they just rub a little bit of the oil on their temples. And because menthol has analgesic properties, it can help with the severity of the migraine attack. So this could be used during a migraine attack if you wanna try something like a little massage. And then last part is the lifestyle modifications. So like I said, mitochondria is one thing to help. The other thing is lifestyle, like the hypothalamus. It is the regulator of everything. The brain of your brain, you need to regulate that. So some of the things that can help you continue to have a better lifestyle is obviously make sure that you're sleeping well, have a good schedule, good sleep schedule. Uh, good eating habits, and I don't mean foods per se, 
well, some foods for sure, like aged cheese, wine, foods that are in tyramine. Those are things that you have to watch out for, but not always the case. But what I mean is don't have long periods of fasting because sometimes low sugar levels can trigger a migraine. And that's, and it was known as that in the forties, the migraine used to be known or used to be called hypoglycemic headache. But now we know more about it. And we now know that a migraine is actually a neurological condition. It has nothing to do with an actual headache, the head itself. It's a neurological brain uh, malfunction. But some things that have been helpful and used in research is the ketogenic diet, which means it's a diet that's high in fats, moderate in protein, and very low in carbohydrates. It is difficult for some to keep due to cultural reasons, but it has shown about 80% of decrease in severity with those who have very high levels of pain in migraines. So 80% is quite a big number. Another one that's similar to the ketogenic diet that follows similar principles is the Atkins diet. The Atkins diet is also low in carbohydrates, but there is no research for migraines. Although I will be curious and very interested to learn how Atkins diet could also be very helpful for uh, migraines because it has similar principles. However, Atkins is more directed to diabetics, but I think it's going to be very helpful because it has similar principles to the ketogenic diet to have very low sugars, very low carbohydrates and high in fats and some protein. Um, now, aerobic exercise, um, if you're not having a migraine, you should definitely, you know, put some time to do, oops, there we go. You should put some time to do like aerobic exercises, cardio, Pilates, running, any kind of thing that will get your heart pumping. It's been helpful to prevent and improve circulation. So again, it does help with that. But remember, if you're having a migraine attack, don't do that. You can't exert yourself while you're under an attack of migraines. You have to just rest and let it wait until it subsides. And then breathing exercises, which is something we'll talk about next, is the vagal stimulation. And the vagus nerve, this is from the vagus nerve, which is the main, one of the main nerves on your parasympathetic system which is your nerve to help you rest and digest, which in this case can help you tolerate your pain tolerance a little bit higher. Uh, the practice that I want to share with you today. Now, if you're watching this, please put yourself in a comfortable position, ideally sitting up. Don't just lay down sitting on your, sitting against the chair, but rather sit up. And um, if you're laying down, that's okay. If you're in, if you're somebody with migraines and having some pain, but can still uh, go with me, great. If not, then please just take the break. Um, don't exert yourself. That's what I'm trying to get at. Now, for this, the mind-body connection is to help us stimulate this vagus nerve, which is anti-inflammatory in nature, and can help us decrease the severity of the pain and will also give us a form of self-awareness and control to respond to stress much in a much more harmonious, tran tranquil way. I call this a way with the pain exercise and let's get started. So being in your comfortable location, let's take a few deep breaths. So as you count, as you breathe in, I want you to count to five. So okay, the breath is here. And then as you exhale, and then all the breath goes out. So let's try again. As you breathe in, count to five. You can do it with your fingers.
Let's do two more. And just please continue breathing, being aware of your breathing as I am speaking. As I continue with the instructions. So next thing, what we're going to try is to form a visualization, some type of visual to keep our, our focus in. So you'll notice as you're breathing in and out, your face muscles, your eyes, and by the way, keep your eyes closed. This is just for us to relax and find a good way to be calm. You'll notice if you can scan your body and you're sensitive in your body, you'll notice that you start feeling more and more relaxed. So as you feel more relaxed, I want you to put your attention in your gut. And if you wanna be very specific, Think of where your belly button is and go behind that into your gut, like midway and think, okay, this is where I am. So think about what, think about that location and to help us facilitate this, imagine a dark blue ball of energy, kind of similar to my shirt or the background behind me if you need to have a visual. So like a little bit blue ball of energy in that area of the gut. Now, this dark area, this dark blue is used in Tibetan meditations to help us relax. It's, it is for the mind. So the mind can calm down from all the stimulus, from all the chaos outside of us. So place your whole attention in the blue ball inside your belly button. As you continue to breathe. Also have that attention in your blue ball of energy. And now, as you breathe in, as you breathe in five, you're expanding that ball. Because if you're breathing naturally, you'll notice that it's your belly that's expanding. So with, you know, your belly is getting a little bigger. So with that, as your belly gets bigger, breathe out, breathe in, and then breathe out. And as you're breathing out, also that ball is shrinking. It's getting smaller. So let's continue with this. The ball is getting larger. The ball is getting smaller and smaller. So I want you to try this exercise using some form of like relaxing music to keep track of time. Ideally, I would use about 10 minutes of this. And I also want you to think as you're breathing in, I want you to just also, if you have to say something, just be thankful of being here in this moment that you could be in a worse position. I know if you're in a migraine situation, I know there's nothing more in the world to not be here, but you are here and you are making it. You are a strong person. You actually have a lot of strength in you. So be thankful as you breathe in, breathe in also gratitude that you're here and you have loved ones around you. And as you breathe out, <sighs> breathe away some of the pain. Sometimes the pain will go with it. And like I've said, 
your pain tolerance will increase, will get a little bit better as you become more self-aware of your body. So ideally, I want you to try this as much as you can, at least once in the morning and once at night. If you can do it more, that's excellent. But 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes at night, breathing in five, breathing out five with that blue ball of energy in your gut, you'll feel great benefits. And the instructions will be written in the transcript of this video. And then some final words that I want to mention. Ah, that feeling right after your migraine ends, right? I'm sure we can all relate to that. Personally, I do not have migraines, but I believe when I was a child, I had similar events. But my mom had them, and she still has to, to this day. She has been able to manage it, thankfully. But I know what it's like to have a migraine. I know what it's like to see people suffer from that and wish that they were not here because of a migraine. So those of you who have a migraine, please continue. This is your brain, something has happened in the brain connection, but it doesn't mean you're in defect in any way. There is no known cure at the moment, but the management can highly improve your lifestyle. I also want you to keep in mind about the mitochondrial health, the powerhouse of the cell that just needs more power, the mental control of your pain, which are healthy ways to subdue the pain. And again, doing these types of exercises and other vagus nerve stimulations will help us with the tolerance of pain. And keep in mind a mixture of natural and uh, drugs in your toolkit medicines, because some drug medicines will work excellent for you. Others may need, maybe you need some natural alternatives. I don't want you to be one for the other. I want you to keep them both. They're both necessary. These medicines are to help cope with the pain, with the migraines. So once again, there's no known cure to migraines, but there is huge amount of management and it's all in your control. I will continue speaking about migraines in the future because this is a, a big topic for many of us. But in the meantime, this is all that I have for you today. If you enjoyed the video, please consider giving it a like and subscribe if you want to see more videos in the future. And here is how you can follow me. If you want to find the transcript, please go to my website at drpalaciosnd.com and you'll be able to uh, find it and read it on your own time if you wish to do so. Thank you so much for your time and we will see you next time.